Okay, guys, thank you for all coming, <laughs> all of the four of you. Um, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's that time of year. Um, I got so many calls today about furnaces, just not lighting and issues um, because it was 87 degrees out there again today. <laughs> so <laughs> winter is getting kind of hard, but um, yeah, I mean, super relevant for us, right? I mean, last week it was in the fifties and I thought for a second winter was here, but I mean, winter's here for everybody else in this world. So just wanted to Welcome the rest of the country that's going to be watching this for the next 10 years. Um, it's going to be that good. It's going to be up there at the top of the list on our classes. Uh, welcome to this show, and I'm so glad you're here. And I'm sorry about winter. It's 86 degrees here. We're sweating. We're miserable. All right. This is our class, uh, Furnace Diagnostic, Sequence of Operation. Um, my goal is super practical class. Uh, since none of you guys know me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with Okay, first things first, with any class, you guys need to get to know your instructor, know me for who I am. Here I am. <laughs> and um, this is gonna be a great, great class, I'm excited. Uh, you guys can call me whatever you need to on here. Um, some people call me Bert, that's fine too. But yeah, I just want you to know the person you're dealing with, be able to trust, obviously it's not about me, this class at all, um, just, but, I've been through some things, you know, seen some things, and um, really I should just start at the beginning and just go with you where, where it started our journey in furnaces. So there's a lot of furnaces in Gainesville. I was born in Gainesville, 1989, so I am an 80s baby, as you can see. I'm literally an 80s baby, so. Uh, the next year, no, I'm just kidding, all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was great. Nice. Okay, so today's class. Um, sequence of operation, common diagnostic issues, replacing failed part, parts, replacing failed parts, flame sensors, checking gas pressure. All right, you ready for that? Yes. We're going to keep it as practical as possible. Now, I do have to say, Brian did a class on this, and some of you were there, and it was way better so far, right? But I mean, he's, um, yeah, I, I don't want to diss him or anything. He's the guy in that picture right there, but right here. But yeah, he's sometimes smarter than us. And so that's not going to be the situation today. We're going to talk about furnaces, a couple different uh, furnace designs here. Anybody ever seen a natural draft furnace in the field in Florida? Natural draft. Mario has. Well, uh, Jacob just was that working on one uh, two days ago. Really? Yep. It was a failed universal board in there. But yeah, interesting. So natural draft flame comes in and the actual heat rising up creates the vacuum that pulls in more air for combustion to the bottom. So there's no um, exhaust blower. Yeah, it's literally just your flames that create that cycle. So you have to have air available for combustion and then exhaust to go up through your chimney pipe. So, yep. Uh, you will still find pool heaters, pretty commonly like that, a pool heater that doesn't actually have a blower assembly. Um, so you guys will see those things. 80% uh, furnaces, the difference here is that we, we still have open combustion at the bottom, right in front of the furnace, air has to be able to get in but we're actually pulling that in through the inducer fan motor and um, and exhausting it out. And so still open combustion, but we have an induced draft controlled by a motor. It's safer, less can go wrong there. And um, there we go. And then 90% furnaces. Anybody seen a 90% furnace in Central Florida? Just me and Sean. It does create its own condensation. Yeah. Yeah. I have worked on that. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. And uh, the one that I saw just had a one pipe attached to it, just an exhaust pipe going up outside to the metal flue pipe from the previous furnace. It was so sketchy. But the difference here, it's closed combustion. So you bring air in, 
through a seal chamber. So you have your piping out to the external wall. You bring air in for combustion. You don't see the flame happen. It's all sealed. It's a lot more controlled and you're using 90% of the heat that you're burning. And so you will actually, then you will exhaust, you'll force the air out. Um, and it will actually be usually decently pretty cold because most of the heat is actually absorbed in the furnace and is going into your home. It's a very efficient system. But in that process of cold air coming in with moisture, there's condensation that happens there. So you have like a drain set up that has to be a part of this. Um, but this is what most of the world up north is going to be dealing with commonly because it's just a lot more efficient way. And uh, we don't have a lot of those around here. So I'm spending most of my time today on here because today's class is about you guys and about us, what we're going to be seeing in the next coming months and try to keep it as practical as possible. Okay, so on a furnace, um, since we're mostly dealing with heat pumps around here, we have a few furnaces. What's the most important difference that a furnace has that a heat pump doesn't? No, not the reversing valve. It is a difference. It's not the most important. They both have blowers. Come on, Joel, you can say it. Fire. Fire. <clears throat> Woo! <laughs> it's too obvious. I said this was going to be a really simple class. It has fire. That's right. Uh, so what do we need to create fire? The rapid yes. oxidation of fuel. That's what it is. Yep. We need uh, fuel to rapidly oxidize. Fuel. Fuel. Um, we need our fuel to, we need a source of heat for the fuel to first ignite. Right? Okay. So we got oxygen, heat, fuel, fire. Makes sense. The only reason I'm showing this is because think about the fact that this is not like, for me, it's more extreme because I didn't grow up around it. We're heat pump country around here, but we're bringing fire into our houses and fuel. And then we're pumping air in to burn it faster and hotter and more clean. Like that's crazy. So furnaces are loaded with a bunch of safeties. And that's where most of this class is going to be. Do we have to keep, this fire from killing us. And so a furnace is loaded with a bunch of safety. So here's a furnace uh, picture that uh, Jessica sent me the other day doing the maintenance on this furnace. And I just wanted to show you where our mixture of fuel, oxygen, ignition, heat source, um, and our gas in. So you can see here, our gas comes in. And then we have our heat source. You see the glowing right here. That's our igniter bright and red. She caught the picture right when it was glowing and, and flames. <laughs> Quality stuff right here. And then you can see the flame down in here actually burning. That's our fuel. And here's our inducer blower. Um, so this is hooked up to the chamber. Let me go back here a couple. You can see the blower hooked up to the uh, heat exchanger chamber. So when it comes on, it's forcing air into that chamber. It's sealed. The flame comes into that chamber and uh, then um, the heat pushes the air out and it exhausts out through the top. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Is that, is that just a graphic with it back and forth? Yeah, so I'm going to be honest with you. This is just like a 3D graphic that yeah. somebody drew. Yeah. This isn't real. Definitely. But that's not what you were asking. No, oh, it, no, it literally, the heat exchangers look like an S, oh, like okay. half of the time. Okay. There are different designs, but yeah, that was, this is a very accurate looking graphic. I realize what you're asking now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. After mocking you, I knew exactly what. Yeah. <laughs> New guy. What? <laughs> Furnace expert much? <laughs> yeah, you can ask anything you want. I probably have the answer. So points of interest. This is another slide about what our class is going to be. Right. But I made some slides and I got some help. And I'm excited about it. So inducer fan motor and the flue pipe that exhausts the air. And our airflow switch, igniter, limit switches, gas valve, flame sensor, furnace board. We're going to talk about all of these. First, let's talk about what they do. And we'll talk about how they go wrong. What's this? Inducer fan motor. Absolutely. All right. So this motor is powered 120 volts. Right here, 
This is the back side, just, just so you can watch it spin. You know it's moving. And then you can grab it and slow it down if you want. That's hard on the motor, and there's really no reason to do that. Good cut your finger, so. But I'll show you later when the camera's off. Pulls in air for combustion. So this is important. We're pulling in air to actually help generate our fire. If we don't have enough air, then we're not going to be able to safely burn the flames through the heat exchanger. We can have the potential of flame rolling out like just the gas building up and then it lighting and rolling out, right? Uh, so, and then also you just need oxygen for fuel. So we gotta have it. Um, and then um, I have pushes out exhaust air in quotation marks. This is the one nerd moment of my entire class. Even though it's pulling in air and like pushing through the heat exchanger, by the time the air gets to the top of the heat exchanger, like by the time it gets out here, the flame, the heat that has been mixed with the air, is causing that to rise so quickly that it's actually under a negative pressure here. So if you've ever noticed, it's never like, we're not making sure these are airtight, watertight seals on an 80% furnace. 90%, you have air in, air out, and it actually is pressurized because we don't have the hot air coming through here. But on this one, it is hot, so there are, uh, different regulations in installing these, like your gas pipes being close to here or anything coming here, they ha you have to have a certain distance um, or um, the type of piping, whether it's double wall or single wall. But the point is, that I'm trying to make is, the hot air is actually going out of here so fast, it's creating a vacuum behind it. So if like you poke a hole, it's sucking in air. All right, so, and then um, just thought that was kind of cool, so. It doesn't actually push it, but I mean, if there was no flame, it would be pushing the air out, but thank you. Thank you for hearing that. Now the nerd moments in classes are great. That's what Brian's really good at. And it makes it really interesting for people who have been doing this for years. However, if I give you too many of those and I have them all, like they're just, my head's just like this combustion of not, I just want you to remember what's practical that you're going to use tomorrow. That's it, I promise. And I won't talk about that anymore. I'm done talking about it. Did it bother you that I talked about it? I'm done. I'm done. All right. So this is our airflow switch is what I call it, but it's actually called a pressure switch. Typically, like manufacturers refer to it as a pressure switch. Why would I call it an airflow switch? <laughs> Why would I call it an airflow switch? Please talk, Joel. You're not just the camera guy, okay? You're here to learn. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I shouldn't yell at my camera guy. <laughs> What, what was that? Oh, someone else said it was measuring the air pressure. Okay, it's reacting to the air pressure. It's not measuring anything, but it. So apparently it's now measuring the air pressure. So it's reacting to air pressure. It proves that there's good airflow. It's normally open when there's no airflow. And then it closes when it's pulled under a vacuum. Okay, so as the motor is running, and pushing air through this chamber, uh, there's a vacuum where the air is coming in and the switch actually closes under that vacuum. And so it's much safer to have the switch hooked up to an area where there's a vacuum because if you had it hooked up to an area where there's pressure and this got blocked, the pressure would still force the switch close. And so the system wouldn't know it was blocked. So we have it hooked up on the vacuum side so that it will only pull in if enough air is moving by to create a vacuum, if enough air is actually, so it's actual airflow switch, huh? Nice, that's not nerdy stuff because that's super practical. Normally closed. Does anybody know what these switches are called? Limit switches. There we go, limit switches. They open on, so they're normally closed. We have this whole circuit of wires going through and the board's like, is everything fine? Do I have the voltage that I'm sending out coming back? Great, all the switches are closed. That means we're not too hot. Some have a manual reset on them. Uh, others automatically reset. They have the bimetal inside. So when it gets really hot, it's like, poof, and then it cools down. Like that. So, um, 
Now our hot surface igniters, our intermittent spark ignition, direct spark ignition. So this is the heat source that creates, uh, that, that lights our fuel, right? So just real quick on the differences in these, hot surface is pretty much what everything is now, pretty much, like that's the majority of what you're gonna see. You have uh, like Rude and Ream, they're still producing the uh, direct spark ignition to where it just instantly sparks. And so the gas valve opens, spark, spark, flame sensor makes sure that it actually came on. And um, so that would be the direct spark. You have the intermittent spark, which you guys are gonna still see on pool heaters. The intermittent spark has a tube coming in from our, um, from our gas valve and connected straight to the gas valve. And so when it gets a call, for heating, it sparks, it feeds gas through that tube, and then there's a little pilot flame that sits there on top of the flame sensor. If the flame sensor senses that we have a little flame, it knows that when it dumps gas, it's gonna light. If we have a small flame, it's gonna light for sure. So before it even dumps gas, it proves flame. The design of that would be to be a little bit safer. Um, so, but yeah. Well, I don't need to go into what's actually more safe. Everybody's using hot surface igniter igniters for the, for the most part right now. A um, few exceptions. You're still gonna see the other ones. But yeah, um, your flame sensor also is your igniter. So there's a voltage sent down and it will actually jump across the flame sensor trying to get to ground. You'll actually have an arc come across there. So higher voltage use, those are frustrating to try to diagnose some pool heaters because they get so dirty and rusted out in that area. Okay, gas valve. Normally closed, that's important. <laughs> the gas valve, when it's not powered, is shut. So we aren't dumping gas into the house. 24 volts is applied to the coil, brings it on. Simple test. Am I getting 24 volts? Okay, it's not my board that's failed. I'm actually getting 24 volts to this thing and it's not opening, it's my gas valve that's failed. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. We're not getting to the diagnostic part yet. Guys, please. And keep the questions about why and how to diagnose it, like for the diagnostic section. Uh, if we go all the way back to the beginning, never mind. So drops gas pressure to the manifold. So the manifold is these burners down here and where the uh, gas actually meets the, the oxygen and the igniter. So it drops gas pressure. You need to have plenty of gas pressure coming in. It regulates it based on the manual adjustment that you enter yourself. They always come from the manufacturer set for a certain parameter, and then you adjust it if you need to. Flame sensor, by far the coolest element on any furnace for a tech mind is the flame sensor. Uh, we're going to spend a little extra time on the flame sensor today. We have one that we're going to install that we're going to um, stock on our trucks. Uh, flame sensors um, are just literally a metal rod with a wire connected to your board, but they sit right in the, in the flame. So if there's pollution in the air or a dirty flame, like you don't have clean flame, or maybe somebody has got something on it in the past, like touching it, finger oils, it can corrode, it can start to break down, it can get dirty, and you have to clean it in order for electricity to pass through it. So, um, again, that was diagnostic, and we're trying not to do that now. Flame sensing rod or flame rectifier, when the flame is present, a small current passes from the rod to ground via flame. So, literally, electricity travels down here. It's hanging in the air. Then there's flame. Electricity travels through the flame, right? That'd be a cool superpower. Can you imagine? Travels through the flame to ground, right? Very cool. Small amount of current. It's not a, it's not a great path. It's just flame. Yeah, go ahead, Joel. What yeah. is the superpower? Uh, the superpower would be the ability to travel through the flame to ground. Electricity can do that. Okay, the furnace board. Um, just pretend that's 3D like everything else. The furnace board receives commands from the thermostat, controls furnace operation, monitors safeties, displays air codes. 
You guys think you know what a board is, all right? Let's move on from that. All right, most important part of this class will be for you guys to understand the sequence of operation, right? If you don't know what it should be doing, how in the world do you know if it's doing that or not, right? Like with anything, sequence of operation. So all of your manufacturers, you pull up the furnace and you read through under the startup section, they will have this detailed sequence of operation for their furnaces. Mwah. This is not one of those. This is one that uh, HVAC school made. Okay, somebody take it from the top. I'll do it since I have a mic. Furnace receives a W call. W calls are call for heat and furnace. And a heat pump, W call would be like our backup heat. But in a furnace, we only have one heat. W call, Re furnace receives it on the control board. Right here, 24 volts from the thermostat. The board confirms that our pressure switch is open. You remember our pressure switch? So it has to be closed in order for it to know it's safely running. But to ensure that it doesn't have a failed switch, it first confirms it's open and then close. So guys trying to diagnose a pressure switch will be like, let me just bypass this. It might be a failed switch. Let me just test everything else. Bypass it, turn it on. No, the board's like way smarter than that. <laughs> nice try. I'm not turning this on. <laughs> Super dangerous. It needs to be open. Then our inducer fan comes on. So it's pulling that air. And after the fan, it responds by closing because of the vacuum pressure, right? Uh, in this drawing, we have the board checks if the circuits are closed. The board actually always checks if the circuits are closed 24 seven. It never stops checking. Ever. Even if you have a power outage, it's checking if the circuits are closed. So you get a Y call and the circuit's not closed, this is still gonna come on. As a safety, they're like, oh crap, circuit's not closed, something might be too hot. Let's just turn this on. This could just sit here running. So it's not technically in the sequence of operation, but it's a pretty important element there. Um, safeties. Safety circuit closed. The ignition sequence begins. If it's a hot surface igniter, they have a delay of like 30 seconds, usually a little less, but they have a delay to make sure it gets blazing hot before we dump gas onto it, right? Whereas if it's an, a spark ignition, a half second after the spark starts, the gas valve is going to open, right? Whereas if, when it's not, you get, you get the idea. Words and everything. Gas valve opens, 24 volts gets applied to the gas valve from the board. It's like, it's safe to dump gas in here. Boom. Flame is proven. How is a flame proven? Uh-huh, via, via the flame rod. What a guy, jeez, man. We need you over here, all right? Come join us. <laughs> Put this guy in a van. Um, flame is proven through the flame rod. So within three seconds, less than three seconds, this thing clicks and there's no flame proven, shuts out, air code. So you will, like, immediately the gas valve is going to close, air code, we don't have flame. We have gas, no flame. I'm not dumping. And then we go through a cycle where this pulls in air and exhausts any of the gas that has been dumped out but didn't light, just pulls it through the system and exhausts it outside. What's so confusing about that? Oh, okay, you're just interested? That's your interested point face? what happens after that, why don't you try again? Okay, so it'll try three times and then go into a lockout. And it's built to try three times because there can be weird anomaly, 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 anomaly I'm an, I'm an anomalies. Na, 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 na. <laughs> um, where the gas coming in has air pockets. Maybe you haven't ran gas in half a year and there's some air pockets. And so like it didn't immediately light. Does it restart all the way back to the beginning? Yes. Yeah, it does. It restarts all the way back to the beginning. Other than your blower, does it shut off? 
and come back on. Yeah, it'll reset all the way at the beginning. Whole sequence of operation. Um, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like I said, prove me wrong, anyone out there. I want you to just try your best. Hit me with your best shot. It restarts at the beginning. And we're about to show you that. If it doesn't, we'll just, you can just edit that out. Blower starts. All right, what blower are they talking about here? Yeah. So this is the air going into your house and coming from your house. And uh, there's a delay between flame and blower because manufacturers care about people. If you're cold in your house and the blower kicks on right away, cold air inside of all that duct work sitting in your attic or under your house, it's getting blasted in. But if we could get this thing flaming hot, and then hit it with air, that first gust of air is just like, oh, yes, so glad I have a furnace and not a heat pump. <laughs> Get some flack about that. <laughs> Let's look at a real sequence of operation. Oh, I know this part. You guys join me. We're gonna turn on the furnace and um, we're gonna watch the sequence of operation in real life. Let's go. First lesson in furnaces, because I don't wanna ever hear about this from any of you this year, okay? Please turn on the heat. Someone, anyone, Adriel? What's wrong? Blank. No display? Yeah. Let me just double check, do I have power? We do have power. <laughs> All right, <laughs> anybody? Anybody know? Uh, the door. That, that's my guy. Oh. You too? Yep. Yeah. Look at this thing. Yeah, these doors will sometimes come loose um, right after Kalos does a maintenance. Like, I don't get it. It's weird. No, the customers will take these doors off to replace their filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, well, only on the side application. But a lot of our units in a garage, it's right under here. So the filter actually where this panel is, this panel goes, mounts on the side, filter slides right in. And then if they don't close their door up tight enough, it's just sitting there rattling and you got intermittent problems possibilities, but here's your switch. So you, you see the switch here? Door switch. We don't have power to our furnace. That's your first lesson. I didn't make a slide for that. Okay, so, power. yep, you wanna um, grab that drill real quick and let's just secure this. Other way. Oh, it's I was ahead of you. Side. Dang it. You, without even you looking, you're just there. like, boom, went for it. We have our call for heat, right? Yep. Cool. All right. And uh, what's going on over here? So the flashing an air code. Oh, no. Sure. Yeah. That's not part of the sequence of operation. How can you tell? Well, it's melted off. I can't really actually see the rest That's of it. That's right. So our uh, long one, or I mean our, our short one is our first letter, and our second one is our first number. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me on that, because that could have got real confusing for everyone. They wouldn't have known what I was talking about. So number 12, let me just read it out. Blower on after power up when power is applied to the furnace and there's a call for heat already. Just, it just has a safety. You turn on power and there's already a call for heat just waiting there. Sequence of operation. Inducer fan motor comes on. Proves that there's suction through here, the switch closes. If the switch closes, they power the igniter. Igniter gets hot. We have a bit of a delay. and you have to turn on the propane tank. It is a common callback. Gas not turned on. Oh, come on guys, really? They come from the manufacturer in the opposition. So we should like every time it's 90 degrees outside, remember, turn it on for when winter comes around for our customers. You guys can check that out on maintenances or if you're an installer, you can just click the switch. Okay, there we go. There was our sequence of operation. Inducer fan motor came on. First, the, the board proved that the switch was open. 
then the inducer fan motor comes on. They won't bring the fan on if the switch is closed. No, it actually will. It will bring the fan on and then pull the air closed that the switch was closed before. Did not close or reopen. Let's just start at the beginning. Proves that the switch is open after we get our call from the thermostat. Proves that it's open. Motor comes on. Proves that it's closed. Then igniter comes on and starts glowing. We have a delay. Uh, we've already proved our safeties are all closed. If one of our safeties were open, that would shut it off. We have our delay. And then uh, the gas valve receives 24 volts. Gas valve opens. And after that, within the next three seconds, it has to prove with our uh, flame sensing rod right here that you see just poked into the flame that there's a path and the current coming in to ground across the flames. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, start this sequence of operation over with our first air code. Just a, oh yeah, so one of the limit switches I pulled which would simulate like a really hot surface right here. So the limit switch would, would open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell that I've been back here. Yep. So everything just instantly shut off because one of our limit switches open and it's going to restart because we're still getting a call for heat. Um, the fastest way to bypass its safety restart process is to turn it off. Oops, that's cool mode. Can you switch it one more to off? And then power back on. So when it gets power and it's still in the off position, give the board just a second. It won't do the, the blower delay thing. Now we can go back to on. So it already noticed that the switch was uh, closed. So when we do this, it's no longer pulling in. Then it should stop us and pull the air code for the switch being still open. So we're actually stopping it at the third step. First was the thermostat W. Second, it proved it was open. Fourth step. The third step, it brings on the motor. The fourth step, it proves that it's closed. All right, what's our air code? Anyone? 31. Yep, so you want to read off 31 real quick? Just a description, first description. All right. Did not close or reopen. So it did close for a half second, but it reopened very quickly. We are back in service. It blew the squirrel straight out of the vent pipe and boom, we no longer have an issue. So next it should be powering our igniter. And that delay gets on and um, let's go ahead and stop it. So it's still gonna call us 24 volts and, and call the relay, but this basically turns off our 24 volts from ever making it to the coil, this little switch right here. Or you could have something from here down the line turned off in any customer's home or gas outside turned off because they didn't pay their bills or something. Hate to hear it. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to freeze. Money don't grow on trees, and I'm no tree, or something like that. All right, so you notice that it went off and then came back on. We talked about this. Could be just a little gas in the lines. I mean, a little air in the lines. It was just a little air in the lines, see? We fooled the board. Like, the board thought it was air. But yeah, he's glad he tried the second time, didn't give up. Yeah, so we have our lockout when flame does not actually occur, ignition proving failure, lockout, which is uh, ignition lockout is actually 14. And then it tells you refer to uh, 34 where you can read why they think that might have happened. And as you can see, <laughs> little flame rollout action here. We had to print out another diagnostic chart. Okay, there's your sequence of operation in person, live and in person with Bert. So let's jump into diagnostics. This is gonna be super practical. This is gonna be your best friend for any 
um, furnace diagnostic issues. First thing I want to say about your common diagnosis, diagnostic issues is you want to know what happened. So when you show up, don't just be resetting it. For instance, you just go straight to take this up, open to look at your board, you reset power, and you've lost your error code, right? So first things first, before you open anything up, look at your indicator light. It's gonna be blinking whatever that last issue was. And it even has a fault on there for a fuse. Like I said, 24 volts <laughs> missing. <laughs> That's kind of cool. They did that on purpose, no doubt. Fuse is open. Yeah, so like low voltage short, it'll be flashing. Even in cool mode, see flash. Super helpful. So don't reset your power. If you do reset your power, then you're gonna be hanging out, hoping to actually see what took place that the, the problem is consistent enough, you can address it and not just be like, oops, it happened last night to you for some reason and I'll never know. So our common issues, um, we'll come back to this chart as needed. We're gonna start with our pressure switch, not opening error code. Pressure switch, not opening error code, number 30. Oh, here we go, 31. Oh, um, we have possible causes, not only what happened, but possible causes. If open longer than five minutes, inducer shuts off for 15 minutes before retrying. So within that first five minutes, it's just gonna keep running. Like I'm gonna keep trying, gonna keep trying. Let's get these squirrels out of here, these frogs out of here, let's scare them out of the vent pipe. I'm just gonna keep trying. And then after five minutes, like, all right, we haven't melted the snow covering the top of the flue pipe, we're done here. So it goes, uh, 15 minutes off for retrying. So you could pull up in that 15 minutes, it's still gonna be pulling your air code. Um, just the fans aren't gonna be running. Don't immediately condemn the motor when it's pulling the air code and you don't see the motor running just because normally you do see it running. There we go, all right, we've covered that. Proper vent sizing, not actually getting the right voltage to our motor, what would be the cause of that? Different causes, I mean, isn't that nice of them to list on here possible causes and we can take a look into this. So we're not getting our 120 volts um, to our motor, then we're not actually, the board is what supplies that 124 volts, right? Because the board has to check that everything else has done its job before it powers the motor. So the furnace board has 120 in, but not coming out to the inducer fan motor at the right time of that sequence of operation, it's the board issue. Mm -hmm. Right right voltage in, not out, board issue. Okay, inadequate combustion air supply. Super important. Let's take a look at the design of this. Um, the outer panel, you ever wondered why these were on here? This needs to pull in air in order to have combustion. You need oxygen pulled in. So this shuts, but it's not airtight, so that it can keep pulling in air. This could be inside your garage. It could be inside your closet. Wherever it's at, there better be a source to outside air coming into that space. So you notice when you're working on furnaces in a closet, they will have like a vent in the ceiling going up into your attic. Or in the garage area, they will have holes cut out in the external walls of the garage, either down in the ground with screen over them or up top with a vent some way that when this is pulling in air, it's not creating a negative vacuum in a tight space, which could be a real problem. Um, there are some of those odd situations where you have a dryer and a furnace sharing the same like closet and everything's been shut. Somebody remodeled their home and they're like, let's just close this in. It looks so ugly, right? And then it's like, they're both just trying to suck in air to do their job. We get under negative pressure and we can't actually pull. The reason that that becomes so dangerous is because without the right amount of oxygen, our, our flame's not actually burning clean anymore. And we're creating a lot more carbon monoxide in that situation. So that's one of the reasons it's so dangerous. You also have the possibility for flame rollout in that. So inadequate air coming into the space um, can be the cause of that. So all of those things um, that we see here that could be a problem are gonna be detected by this guy right here. 
We need to know how to test if this is doing its job. We need to know what it actually does. If we got the error code, let's check if we have a blocked vent pipe. Mud daubers, classic Florida, am I right? Mud daubers filling that thing out. They'll get so crazy, they'll come down in here and they'll try to escape and they will literally clog this pipe. You'll just open it up and there'll be a wasp head. Like, and you're like, oh, that's weird, pull it out. Another one right behind it. Another one right behind it. They all like, they all um, hatched. They all hatched out of their, cr tried to crawl out and just clog this pipe. Crazy stuff. Yeah, take it out, push a wire through, a bunch of dried out, dead wasp. <laughs> Good times. It could be all the way at the top, anywhere below, and usually pretty easy to take this off and look up, right? Um, or you just find a way, okay? Thanks. Um, also, if you take it off and you turn it back on before you actually are creating combustion, the air switch proves closed, then you've eliminated that it's actually inside the pipe. You know what I mean? You took it off and it's exhausting right here. Let's just not leave it off and, and let the exhaust dump to where that space is or anything crazy like that. But you get, you get what I'm saying here. Another possibility would be in the uh, blower compartment where there's a wheel in there. So there could be something jammed in that wheel. You know, uh, Jesus's first call. We have a we have a video up on HVAC school, Jesus' first furnace diagnostic call. And in that call, we found a frog caught in the wheel, a massive frog. And there he was, dead, in the wheel. And we had to, we had to take him out of the wheel and we had to remove him from the space of the wheel in order for it to work, so. Yeah, yeah, up north, the much more common, you have like squirrels and birds because they're literally trying to survive the cold. We're here, we're just like tree frog, lizard. <laughs> Great, not nearly as awesome. Raccoon, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so yeah, so anything from the blower wheel all the way to the chamber blocking airflow, let's pull that apart and let's check for that. If it is blocking the wheel, you're gonna be seeing that this thing's not spinning, right? Our motor's not actually spinning or it's gonna be pulling crazy amps or it's gonna be overheated, right? So that's a possibility. Uh, we could have a failed inducer fan motor, which we will talk about in the failed inducer fan. We will not talk about that. We're gonna talk about it right now. Failed inducer fan blower. How do we test if our blower's failed? Yep, how many volts does it get? 120, so during the sequence of operation when it should have voltage. Are we getting 120? We can also take an amp draw. Yeah, to see if we're actually getting current passing through. We can touch the motor. Okay, it might be overheated now, but clearly it was trying. You know, bless its heart. Like, doing everything it can. Um, so then we're not like immediately assuming motor in that situation. Something's caused it to overheat. I mean, it can overheat and fail too, but yeah. So voltage, 120 to our inducer blower motor. Um, can it actually spin freely? Normal blower diagnostic there. Uh, let's go back to the, we covered the jam blower wheel. Damaged or loose hose, um, especially on pool heaters where everything right here is outside. This hose, the gas pool heater can be cracked. So like trying to suck through a straw that like got kinked and cracked and <laughs> oh, so far it's not satisfying at all. No, well, the air switch is not satisfied either. So then they are pretty sensitive. Loose wires between here and the board. Let's not forget the obvious, something disconnected. That's why it's not proving close. You could take the wires off and make sure it's actually close. Um, I'll typically check for 24 volts here Make sure I still have it on the other side. If I have it on both sides, it's closed, it's passing through and coming back. Um, it could be apparently, like I put it on there, a failed switch. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Eye rolling emoji, am I right? We can uh, actually check 
to make sure that we have um, a vat, we're under a vacuum, like a minimum of 0.3 should pull in these switches. Uh, does anybody know how to use a manometer at all on any level? Great, come up here. Let's just do that real quick. Um, because if I get a call about, I think this uh, switch has failed and I'm gonna be like, okay, what is the uh, static pressure on the blower chamber? One of the easiest ways to find out if it's airflow or just like a mechanical switch failure or something else, wiring. Go ahead, Adriel. Push the zero. So we've zeroed it out. Let's go ahead and turn it back on. And you can wait for this. The AC guy turned the, uh, the fan on from auto to on, thinking he was turning on the system. So I'll we'll never be upset at a customer again. Yep, what do we have? 0.6, cool. That switch should be closed. Well, nice, yep, so knows. that has proved we got airflow all the way through the system. So our issue is here, switch, or the possibility of a failed board. So I put that down here, at least likely, even the switch is more common than the rest of this stuff here, right? But we gotta go through that whole list and just think about what its function is and what it's trying to protect against. And then you can connect that to where you need to go next to find those issues. Water can get in them, especially on a 90% furnace. There's a lot more cold air and condensation going on in that airflow system. Water can get in them. Or, you know, you could just have a hurricane recently. And uh, Kyle called me today. He went to replace a furnace board it wasn't working in cool mode, wasn't bringing the blower on. And uh, testing it in heat, he finds that the switch isn't working. Unplugs the hose and water just pours out. Yeah, so water can get into that system. So just keep that in mind. That is a thing that will cause, can cause the float to actually fail. So, what I, so that's where I was going with this. Uh, moisture getting in there and then those metal components that are closing under the negative pressure that is sitting here. And then when there's negative pressure, it's like, pfft. Now electricity can pass through. Water is getting in that mix, corroding. Yeah, water can't actually do that. Limit lockout air code. All right. So um, typically, if you walk up to a furnace and you actually have this air code, we have this switch right here, the resettable one, which on this system is down here. Little pop, and this is located in the area where the flame will roll out if there's an issue with the flame. And so if that one goes, they don't want that coming back on without a technician resetting it, right? If you have flame rolling out, whereas these are on hot surfaces, this is connected to this pipe. We don't want that being too hot going through your uh, roof or whatever. Um, and then these other ones are connected to the actual, this surface. So these are like surface area limit switches. Uh, but the one that is the flame rollout, where on an older furnace or a pool heater, it will actually be like the white silicone with the fuse link that it just burns up internally. Those situations, that typically means you had way too much heat right there in an area where there should never be that kind of heat. And so you have to reset it manually. They want somebody on site investigating what happened. Whereas a situation where we have a limit switch open and it locked out because it happened. How many times does that need to happen? Limit circuit lockout. If the limit draft safeguard flame rollout vent change to open longer than three minutes. Okay, so it's not how many times, it's longer than three minutes. So if it's open longer than three minutes, which the second it opens, it turns off and it still stays hot for longer than three minutes, hot enough to stay open it's gonna go into a lockout. So the board does the, that, it recognizes that switch. Yep. So the- In that position for yep. three minutes and then the board, it's a board lockout. Mm -hmm, it's a board lockout. Okay. Whereas when you saw me unplug it and put it back in right away, yeah. it was just like, all right, let's keep going. Yeah. So customer has a dirty filter. The airflow coming across that heat exchanger is restricted. The heat exchanger gets a lot hotter than normal. The exhaust is hotter than normal. 
either this one or the other one is open for longer than three minutes, we have a lockout. So you come back, you turn everything on, it runs great. No problem. Because it's just a just enough airflow restriction that it takes a runtime, certain amount of runtime to get that hot. So first lesson of limit switches. If the switch is open, there's been an error code or it's failed. Always ask the question, what caused it? And try to witness it, ha recreate the problem. Yeah. You're going to have to spend time if it's not happening again. What if there's a lot of calls on the board? If there's a lot of calls on the board, you just, you know, you tag it, turn off the gas, move the customer out of the home, run. That, that's a lie. Okay, uh, limit switches. Partially blocked flue pipe right here. So it's getting hotter than it should, but it's still enough airflow that this is engaging, but it's getting hotter than it can or it should over time. So that could be part of it. You're gonna to need to be looking for those mud daubers at the top of the flue pipe or whatever. Um, that can create this problem. We have a flame rollout situation that I talked about. What could cause a flame rollout? Not enough oxygen, great. So it's not cleanly burning. So we have more fuel dumping in than we have oxygen to consume. The, the fuel will kind of burn up. Maybe a gust of oxygen rolls in there. <laughs> that all just ignites. Yeah, that's good. So we're gonna make sure we have proper amount of air coming in. Another thing that could cause it would be you know, air, pockets air pockets in the gas yeah. valve. I don't think so, no. Um, another thing could be the igniter. It's getting hot, but it's got a crack in it. It's not what it used to be. There's an issue going on with the igniter. And so then the gas has repeatedly come on and off. And maybe that third time or so, a little bit more gas than typical. Now, usually on a furnace like this, manufacturers have the safeties to protect you from that, but you'll notice that your rollout's a lot more likely to happen on a pool heater, especially that since we run into more natural drafts, but much more likely to happen on something like a pool heater. They'll be sitting outside, there'll be a lot of wind just blasting into here, and that can uh, create a flame rollout. Um, so then wrong gas pressures where it's not burning clean. Um, could cause a flame rollout. Uh, there's a time that Customer called and said the pool heater wasn't working and I show up and they're like, yeah, it's not working. Uh, if you could just figure it out. A couple of young guys who were pretty excited to have me there. And I don't know why they were so excited. So I go out to the pool heater. I'm just kind of looking around. I'm like, oh, some melted stuff here. You know, the signs that maybe we had a rollout, like just partial, but it's a pool heater that can happen, you know? And I look up and they're both just like, their heads around the corner, just watching. I'm like, hi. They're like, we're just watching. Turns out I'm like the third pool guy that they called out. When it went to ignite, it just boom, right in front of my face, seared my facial hair, like my facial hair. I was yelling at those guys. They, they're like, our dad's not here, but he told us to call people to check it out. And you're the third guy, you can't figure it out. I'm like, you knew this was going to happen. You didn't tell me. I was so pissed. Yeah, I disabled it. I wrote all over the inside of that heater, like don't let somebody prank you again and did not offer to a solution for them. Just said you're gonna have to call somebody else. I disabled it multiple layers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody's coming back. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's legal to disable the heater here in a pool heater here in Florida, but I did in that situation. I'm not gonna lie. So yeah, flame rollout, it's a real thing. Can happen. Loose wires. Again. Pool heaters, you guys are my pool heater people. The loose wires also can be corroded in. It's not loose, but it's been rusting. It's like breaking down and it, electricity is not passing through. It's actually literally starting to crack even though it looks like it's in place. So you've got a limit error code. It could be the wire issue, not just the limit switch. Let's think the whole picture when this happens. Like I said, anything from clogged coil we're not even using that, but our air is passing through. Dirty blower wheel, filter, 
all those things are air is brought in to transfer heat. We need the, act the right amount of air to match how much heat we have in this furnace to keep everything cool enough that we're not opening our limit switches. So you are typically looking at airflow related stuff and even if it's the airflow inside the flue pipe from the exhaust fan. Um, and then if it's a flame rollout, you're, you're gonna see signs, right? Your wires might be a little seared here. You might have some black down in here. If it's a flame rollout, that's scary. Use a lot of caution in trying to start that up. Try to figure out what might have happened before you go to turn something on, right? Um, another thing that could cause a flame rollout would be like a gas valve failure where it's not closing down all the way. Um, so we have a little bit of gas buildup, comes back on the light. Worst case scenario. I mean, let's not even talk about that. That would be, that would be awful. Um, I'm going back to our gas valve slide because I don't actually have a gas valve diagnostic um, slide. So gas valve failure, how do we diagnose a failed gas valve? Anybody? Check the gas pressure to see if gas is getting through the valve. That's right. So this is one of the most misquoted things that I've noticed in our history is that, um, well, everything else is working. I hear the gas valve trying, but it's just not opening it's probably stuck, they do fail. So that's one of the reasons it's misquoted because you do find it failed. And then I asked the question, well, what were the gas pressures coming in and going out? Well, I didn't check that. You have no idea if this thing's actually working. If you haven't checked inlet gas pressure, is it actually getting enough pressure to burn and then outlet to prove that it's not actually passing through? Yeah, good. I was gonna say one of the other things you're working on the gas pack, package unit, mm -hmm. is that the actual burner is a bit clogged as well just from being outside. So it could be allowing gas through, but if you think the burner's not lighting and you think it's a gas issue, yeah. the gas that's true. not be failed. Yep. So that's why knowing how much So right on the little nipples that come out of the end of the burner, there's just a little tiny hole on those, they could be clogged or dirty, especially on a pool heater. Um, that's another thing that can cause flame rollout. So where it's kind of dumping around the igniter and lighting a little bit late. Okay, so, when you go to uh, diagnosis, we want to make sure we got 24 volts in. We have pressure before our gas valve and no pressure coming out. Okay, so our pressure before our gas valve, for instance, if you only just check your pressure before and you're not checking it when the gas, pressure, gas valve is supposed to open, you might have, let's say, just a little bit left in our propane tank. This customer has a propane heater on a pool heater, for instance. You might just have a little bit of gas pressure that's built up and it's enough that you're hitting your manufacturer specs on inlet gas pressure. But the second it opens, that dumps through and that pressure goes down to zero. Where you should maintain inlet, inlet gas pressure if the gas valve's open. You should maintain that pressure, that minimum pressure when it's open. So you can't just check if you have it there, you have to check it while it's trying to call. You get everything set up. You restart your sequence of operation. You see the igniter glow red, click. You hear the little tick, tick. The 24 volt coil's trying to open that gas valve. Then you should see the uh, pressure making its way through the valve. If it's a failed valve, you'll have good inlet pressure, no pressure coming out of that valve. So it could be stuck closed. Yep. Oh, oh, great, great question. So at the end of the class, we're actually gonna go over Measuring gas pressure with manometer. So you use the manometer and they have ports there. Yep, mm -hmm. that's part of cl class. Um, so there's your gas valve diagnostic. Please no calls where we replace a gas valve and it just turns out the propane tank is empty. Please, <laughs> please no calls. Be on pool heaters, people aren't actually using a furnace with a propane tank, we're talking about pool heaters. Flame sensor. Okay, this is a uh, probably one of the number one reasons that we're out for a furnace issue is a flame sensing rod. So let's just talk about that. Reasons that you might pull the failure to prove ignition error code. It means that the board is taking it through the entire sequence of operation, even the gas valve opening, but within three seconds, it has not proved any flame. Uh, there has not been a current flow through that into the flame. 
So we have our error code. And then if that happens three times, we have a lockout, okay? So the gas valve could be stuck closed. We've talked about that. This is your error code for that. There's no like gas valve failed error code. It's, we don't have flame, error code. Sometimes the flame is burning fantastic and it still pulls the code. That's an issue with our flame sensor. We either have a board that is not um, sending voltage to the flame sensor or detecting it. We have a flame sensor that's damaged, could be cracked um, and starting to ground out inside the flame sensor uh, because of this uh, uh, porcelain is cracked right here. That, um, that's around the flame rod that keeps it from actually grounding out, right? So it needs to not touch ground. You can't, I've tried to jump right when back in my young, like first furnace, like, oh, it, go, it needs ground. Just dump it onto the ground. That's not good. That doesn't work at all. Yeah, it, it's a very small amount of current that should be passing through there. So if this is cracked and it's actually grounding out at the base of the flame sensor or the flame sensor is dirty. If you look at it, it looks dirty, clean it. So like something like steel wool or like an abrasive uh, cleaning pad, like a little cleaning cloth, that's just a little bit tougher. You can scrape it clean. Mm -hmm. Why was I told that a dollar bill works the best? The, there's this thing about dollar bills in the trade where people use dollar bills like whoosh, and they get them clean and it works. So that's why you were told it does work. Apparently dollar bills also hold human oils and other potential dirty stuff that you get on there and it gets really hot. Maybe it hardens onto the flame sensor and over time corrodes it and damages it. So I heard if you use a $20 bill, it was 20 times. 20 times is good with a $20 bill. So take that tip home. Manufacturer says right here, clean it with steel wool. And when I say right here, I mean, right there. Flame sensor must not be grounded. Uh, oxidized buildup on the flame sensor clean with fine steel wool. You probably thought I was lying when I said that, but I just found it. Please guys, let's stay focused on our class. Um, damaged wires, maybe coming out of the back here, some heat damage on the wires, something like that. Like we've talked about, it's a very small current that actually passes through there. Um, the amount of current that you need to see Passing through there, you have to actually have a meter that can measure uh, microamps. So like mil a million, like point million, like a mil milliamps, microamps. Yeah, divided by the million, it's microamps, all right? And so it's crazy small amount of amps. And um, so something like a melted wire, that poor connection, something like that could really throw that off. We don't have a lot of current passing through there got to be clean. If you guys have this HVAC school app, you're going to find in the checklist exactly how to test your flame sensor. I am running a little low on time, so um, uh, I will show you this when we install our new flame sensor today. Um, but we'll walk through these steps. Here's some things to test. And this is really important that we talk about this. It senses current through the flame to ground, right? So if we have a poor ground, if we have a poor neutral terminal coming in, poor connection or a neutral terminal, rust or something on our ground wire connection, if we don't have this cleanly grounded to our neutral, to the same side that our transformer is cleanly grounded to, then current is not going to pass through. And so you will pull this error code with the flame sensor when actually it's just a grounding issue on the furnace. Um, so you can check between ground and your neutral leg coming in. So first connection point from power, neutral, ground, on right here. Do we actually have a good connection? Okay, my unit's grounded well. Move on to other diagnosis areas with that. Is my board actually sending the current? You can test that uh, with microamps testing, which we'll do that. Um, let's jump straight into uh, actually installing a flame sensor. So I have a flame sensor. Uh, White Rogers has made a flame sensor um, that uh, from Emerson. 
and it's a universal premium flame sensor. It can go in so many different applications. They actually have a chart on the box. They have a chart in their app. If you go to the White Rogers app that you can type in the part number of whatever flame sensor you're working on, boil, boilers or cooking equipment or furnaces or pool heaters. You have that flame sensor, type in the, uh, uh, the actual part number of that and you can see if it's a match here. In the match descriptions, they will actually give you like color codes for what needs to be done. No change can be done on green or we need to bend it on the blue. Um, so, but let's go ahead, come on and join. So we have our flame rod and then we have our wire that comes with it. So these connection points would be the typical sizes you'll see. They also have a backup, like a smaller spade um, and then a screw for securing it and then a shield for if you need to modify it, bending it, whatever you got to do, you can slide the shield over that. Anybody here replaced the flame sensor? Nope. I don't think any of you have done this. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. I'm gonna power down and we're just gonna walk through this. So you can have this on your truck, check out the part number on the old one and match up to what needs to be done. So right in here, we have our flame sensor. I'm gonna go ahead and unscrew the screw that's holding it in place. Pull that out. So this is what you'll do when you have to clean it. Right here. And you can see it's a little bit dirty, right? It's not perfect. Um, you can do a continuity test with your meter from end to end, and that would let you know that it's not cracked or actually something damaged in there. Uh, so let's pull that out. So this is one that's bent. Um, and when it goes in and we have our screw in place, you see the angle? We actually need that exact angle with our, our new rod so that we're in the flame. We have to be in the flame, right? Um, so if you look on the flame sensor, you're gonna have a part number right on the base of the flame sensor. So let me go ahead and match that part number up. This is a carrier piece of equipment, LH33W51. And you don't have to do this every time. I'm just demonstrating using all of this uh, Z51. So it's right here in the blue. We're going to be bending it, which means it's probably going to be perfectly long. We're not going to actually need to cut it. Um, the other color would be bending and cutting. All right, so go ahead and lay the instructions out. You're going to take your flame sensor and position it right here on the graph that it shows, right on the base of this line right here. And you, the side with the screw, just push that down into the line. So this will be our reference point for our old and our new one, right? So now we've lined up which bend. It's the 73 degree bend that we're going to match it up to. So with that laying against the paper on the bend, then we can take our, uh, ne our next flame sensor down here. This is our Emerson Universal Flame Sensor. Well, oh, I almost had a screw on the wrong side. That would have worked out fantastic. So as you can see, when you lay it down like that, our spades are lined up and they're both pushed in like that. Um, so you can just confirm that, but that's why you do this right here. And then we'll need to bend this to our 73. So to bend it, we just protect the sleeve like this. Now, if, if you are a little bit messy, you can put some gloves on so your fingers don't touch the flame sensing rod. Now, only half of the people out there think that this matters. And I'm not gonna say where I am on this, but Brian thinks that this matters and he's our boss. So we're gonna put gloves on just to make sure we're not putting oils on the flame sensing rod. Line that up and then bend that over. So let me put the shield on. And so the whole point that I would, line this up and so I'd know my reference point on where to bend. So I can grab the pliers right at the point where the bend's going to be, right? And now I know I need to bend it straight down like this. So now I'm going to come over to a sharp surface and hold it in place and then bend it down. It's probably not enough, but that'll be more fun. You don't want to go perfect the first try, right? Line it back up, we're gonna have to keep going. It was a 73, not a 35 degree bend. Okay. 
So the shield is there to help you not damage the flame rod. If you gouge it, um, you can create issues with it actually being able to read correctly. Where do we go? Third time's the charm. Much better if you actually hang it off an end like this. This is how they have it on their instructions. So I can actually come down a little bit lower. And there's our lineup. We're almost perfect. Boom. Go ahead, go ahead. No shame. So now I know that as I mount this, we're actually gonna be positioned into our flame. So I can take and compare with this one. Now on here, you don't actually need to cut it. It barely hangs out longer than the old one. And it's not long enough to actually hit the metal, which is why in the instructions for this model, you don't actually have to cut it. But I'm gonna show you how easy that is to do. You got this right here, right? So before you squeeze down on like any heavy metal, it might be a good idea for that piece that could come flying off. That piece, boom. Not easy, cool. Now, um, if need be, if this wire is damaged in any level, then you have a replacement wire that you can connect back down to the board. This wire happens to be in great shape. It is a training opportunity for you guys and for the rest of the world. We'll leave that to the field. That in my most smart place possible. Sweet. Boom, so now our flame sensing rod is right here into the flame. You can see, I don't know how well you can actually see back there, but it is sticking right where the flame's going to be. Okay, so uh, while I got you here, Centered around, centered around the flame rod. Let's go ahead and show you how you would test the flame sensing rod. So I'm gonna put it down here to my micro amps on the meter. And this would let me know, is my board actually sending the current through the rod or is the, is the rod actually doing its drop job? Do I have something else going on? And so because it's sm such a small amount of current, I can't use the magnetic field that you would use for larger current. Another nerd fact about this is that it's actually, um, as it passes through the flames to ground, it um, rectifies the flame to DC voltage, a DC voltage pulse. That's why they also call it a flame rectifier. So that AC voltage comes in and it actually pulses DC voltage and the board will read DC voltage. And that's how it knows that it's actually turned on. So. Somebody want to turn this on. We got the breaker 15 amp up here. Boom. Okay, so if we come back to our slide, how many voltage, how much voltage um, or current, I'm sorry, how much current, DC current, does it say on the last picture? One to 10. One to 10, depending on equipment, but you're typically seeing two to six. All right, so right here we have five DC volts. So typically between two and six. And I'm literally making the circuit myself. It's a little bit easier with clamps on the end of this when you're testing it. Um, but no, I'm using meter leads. There you go, new, brand new flame sensor works. It's doing its job. Sweet. Safety is what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Next are three main possible issues. Gas leaks. When I put this together for the symposium, there was about four leaking joints. And of course I didn't test it. We were just in a rush. And I, you guys had so much fun roasting me the entire time for that. It was ridiculous. And it was because I was wearing safety goggles. It really threw me off. Somebody smells gas, take it seriously. They're not just a crazy person. You smell gas, stop, call your manager, 
ask people to step out of the area if it's that bad. Ask people, okay, let's just step outside while I try to figure this out, right? And understanding gas is heavier than air. You walk into a space and you smell real heavy. It's like super thick down here and you're starting to smell the film, the, the, the um, fumes, my guy. Understanding that too about gas, I will sometimes, I'll walk in and be like, and I'll just go down to the floor because if it's a lot stronger there, we're packed in this space. Everything's got to shut off. We got to ventilate. We got to get the gas out of there. I'm not pushing the manual button for the garage door open. I'm doing it by hand. Like all that stuff you got to be thinking about. Next thing that we want to talk about, carbon monoxide. It is way more common that people die of carbon monoxide from their furnaces than gas leaks because gas, they put an odor into the gas so you know what's happening. Gas doesn't naturally have a smell, but they add that so you know what's happening and typically people can save themselves in that situation. Whereas carbon monoxide, you're not going to smell this in your house. It's the silent killer. And if it's, if you have a carbon monoxide issue in your house and it's low enough, everybody's just kind of getting sick. Their immune systems are coming down. You're not really sure what's going on. So what are some things that we can do to prevent carbon monoxide in a home? Warn people about carbon monoxide or to, um, catch it when there's a problem. Like what are, as technicians, what are some of the things that we can do there? Heat pump. Cool the heat pump. Huh? Don't smoke in the house. Okay, don't smoke in the house. We create your own carbon monoxide in the house. Okay, but that's, we're talking about furnaces though. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We have carbon monoxide detectors right in there. Every furnace job that you're going to, maintenance, service, whatever, find out if they have one in the home that's working. You can stock those on your van. That can be an upsell. This is a much better carbon monoxide detector uh, than what you have. You, it, you could take a pretty sensitive carbon monoxide detector to actually pick up dangerous levels, right? You don't want to just only have one that will go off in the event when things are dumping and crazy in the house and people are passing out. Uh, you want one that actually goes off when there's just a very small amount of carbon monoxide in your house and it can warn you that you have a problem that over time is going to cause an issue. And so we do have those smoke detectors, smoke detectors, typical, I don't know the numbers between like parts per million, um, between a typical smoke detector and one that you actually should have right now that they make that capable of reading uh, parts per million that are pretty small. But um, we stock them. So yes, that's one thing. Okay, so that's some uh, prevention that we've done there um, with detectors. As technicians, prevention that we can do is actually inspecting our heat exchangers. So one common reason that carbon monoxide gets inside your house is that the heat exchanger is completely sealed chamber that does not mix with your air. The gas comes in, the air comes in, the flame is burning through there, and it all exhausts through that pipe right here. It does not mix with your home air. It only makes the metal surfaces hot and your home, home air passes over the metal surfaces. But if this chamber is cracked, which it will eventually over time, there's a lot of heat there with them coming on and off, or it can rust out. They can be cracked or rust out. And that's when you actually have the fumes and the stuff like that blending with the blower air as it passes over there, you have cracks. And so that's how carbon monoxide can actually get into your house. Yeah. How would you like, pick that up? You have to pull out everything to check that. That's such a great question. So one of the best ways of picking it up, like on an 80% furnace and you have an open furnace like this, mm -hmm. is you turn your system on. We're going to go through the cycle right now since we haven't done that all the way to the blower running yet. Guys, please. So uh, if you don't push fan on, the blower doesn't come on right away. And there it goes, it shuts off the bar. So your furnace is gonna come on, and then as the flames get it hot, you have a delay in there, and then the blower comes on. Well, you stand here watching your flames. If When that blower comes on, you see your flames, they start dancing. Then you know the air in the house is mixing with the chamber of those flames. It's one of the easiest ways, one of the most sure ways to actually tell. 
or a combustion analyzer that you've actually tapped into your combustion chamber will tell you if you have out, outside air, like the levels of carbon monoxide or, or what else that you have in there. A combustion analyzer will actually tell you that. Um, so when the blower comes on, you're watching your flame. And if you see it like, we do not have any of this air should not be mixing with that. And so it's another important reason, like your, your uh, wires that come down through the board, those holes need to be sealed or anything you've drilled into the side. Let's go ahead and, and seal up those holes so that we know that like the air here is not being affected by any of the air going into the house. Um, so blower came on, you guys couldn't see a single difference. You still like, you'd be sitting there watching it and it'll, as the air passes through there. So that's one way. Um, in that event, or when you're just checking the heat exchangers, you take out this and you pull your blower out. You can actually come in underneath them with your flashlight and go over the heat exchangers and see the bottom if they're rusted out and cracked. You can see the tubings. Or through the top of this coil, you can open it up and there's like an access panel on, on um, the front of that A-frame coil or the N coil. There's an access panel, you can pull that down and shine down in there and see the top of your heat exchangers to actually inspect them. Carbon monoxide, serious threat. This is what, it's what actually kills more people in this. Uh, as a technician, if you're working around a lot of furnaces, a lot of our guys up north have personal carbon monoxide detectors that are really accurate, really sharp. They just walk around all the time. Like a lot of our friends up north are walking around here at the symposium with that just right there. And we're all like, ooh, that's so cool because we see a furnace like once every three weeks in the winter. Um, but yeah, that's a good idea as a technician. You can actually have one. And whenever you're going into a space, get alerted, something's going on here. Uh, having your own personal detector that's really accurate. Flame rollout. Another potential that's just things that we've already addressed in this class, but that's the third possible you have a gas valve not closing all the way, a leak happening. So one of our connection points is leaking. The furnace comes on. Meanwhile, all this whole chamber has been filled with gas because of one of those leaking points. The furnace comes on and poof, there's a rollout that happens. We've had our sensor should shut that off, the furnace off in that situation, but your leak is still gonna continue. So um, when there's a flame rollout, check your gas lines for leaks. There's a Burt Life video on checking for gas leaks, using the sniffer, some bubbles. Yeah, it's everything you need to know about finding gas leaks. It's the very first Burt Life video I ever made. Most important thing to know on checking gas pressure, boys and girls, most important thing to know on checking gas pressure, your gas pressure that is described by the manufacturer, where it should be and shouldn't be, is, uh, Measurements that are taken while it's running. Flame is burning, okay? You have a higher pressure when it's not dumping through, potentially, and obviously you need it dumping through to check your manifold pressure. So you have inlet, manifold, pressure. Be able to check both of those. All of that is outlined right here. And uh, so thanks for staying as long as you have and coming in for the class. I hope this was practical. I hope it's what you need. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.